mobile devices to silent. Um, I'm going to ask members to introduce themselves when speaking, as nameplates might not be um, visible. Um, can I begin by welcoming um, Professor Anne Skelton to give evidence to our committee. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Professor. And can I invite you to make an opening statement, please? Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity to um, address your committee. Um, I'm representing the Committee on the Rights of the Child here today um, to provide information about the revision of General Comment Number 10 of uh, the deal, dealing with juvenile justice. Um, I am a professor of law, and so although I might from time to time refer to developments for psychology or brain science, um, I'm not an expert in that regard, but I have spent most of my career dealing with um, child justice reform. Um, perhaps I can begin by explaining that in 2010, the committee decided to issue a general comment on juvenile justice. Um, general comments are issued from time to time by the committee as an interpretation of articles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and one of the provisions uh, relevant to your hearings was that that dealt with the minimum age of criminal responsibility. And what the committee there um, said was that um, the, the committee had observed from the reports being made before it that there was a wide range of different ages and different approaches when it came to states' parties setting minimum ages. And the committee said that... Um, it had frequently responded to this by saying that all countries that had a minimum age of below 12 um, were, in their view, in breach of international obligations. And so the committee said, it can, from these recommendations, it can be concluded that a minimum age of criminal responsibility below the age of 12 years is considered by the committee not to be internationally acceptable. States' parties in, are encouraged to increase their lower minimum age of criminal responsibility to the age of 12 years as the absolute minimum age and to continue to increase it to a higher age level. The committee went on beyond this to say, at the same time, the committee urges states' parties not to lower their minimum age of criminal responsibility to the age of 12. A higher minimum age of responsibility, for example, 14 or 16 years of age, contributes to a juvenile justice system which is in accordance with the Convention, deals with children in conflict with the law without resorting to judicial proceedings, providing that the child's human rights and legal safeguards are fully respected. Um, what then has happened over the, the intervening years since uh, 2007, when general comment number 10 was issued, was that the committee has um, monitored how states' parties have responded to that. And indeed, many states' parties have increased their minimum age of criminal responsibility. There were a few incidents, however, where states' parties... Um, rested on their laurels, believing that 12 was now uh, an acceptable minimum age and therefore they didn't need to increase it, which meant that they weren't reading on beyond uh, the, the sentence that dealt with 12. Um, and also, in some unfortunate instances, states' parties even moved to reduce their minimum age of criminal responsibility. These were among the reasons that caused the committee to decide to review the uh, minimum age of criminal responsibility uh, provisions within a broader review of general comment number 10. I believe that you have seen that in this, these new, this new revision, um, it is proposed by the committee that 14 be considered the minimum age and still that states that go higher than that with 15 or 16 as a minimum age of criminal responsibility are commended by the committee. I think those are my opening remarks, and I uh, would welcome any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Professor um, Skelton. I suppose, can I open um, things up by just asking um, what you think Scotland would need to put in place or consider before raising the age? And would you accept that there's probably going to be um, considerable work to get our institutions ready for that raise? Well, it certainly is true that it's important what one does 
with regard to the children below the minimum age of criminal responsibility. And this is sometimes an error that is made by states' parties, that, that increasing the age um, doesn't mean that we can... Uh, stop worrying about the children below that age. And, and indeed, we still need to be concerned about them and to provide provision for them. I do, however, think that within the context of Scotland's hearing systems, you already have a system which might be described as a hybrid welfare justice model um, in which you already have a very broad range of options available to you, which puts you in an advantageous position vis-a-vis -vis other countries that might have to still develop um, a strong set of options for children who don't have criminal responsibility because you already um, have a system whereby children could be referred to your, your hearing system either on the basis of welfare or offending issues. Uh, you've already determined that. Um, what it would mean, I suppose, is that a, an increased number of children would be referred to, uh, to, to other services rather than going... Um, through the offender route, uh, you would know better than I what the numbers uh, are, but I would imagine that these numbers are relatively small because the cohort of children committing crimes under this age, in this age group, tends to be relatively small. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to open up to the committee now and ask Mary Fee to come in and introduce herself. Thank you, um, convener, and good afternoon, Professor Skelton. My name is um, Mary Fee. There are a couple of questions that I would like to ask you, <coughs> and, and the first is on our international <coughs> obligations. There has been a, a, an exchange of correspondence between the Commissioner for Human Rights and the Scottish Government, specifically on the age of, of criminal responsibility. And the Scottish Government has highlighted um, in, in their response that as Scotland has a unique system, and in your previous answer, you already pointed out the, the hybrid system that we, we have in Scotland. But the letter from the government says that we have a unique system. We take a, a, a wider approach within our children's hearing system to young people and, and crime. Um, do, do you think that our unique system almost gives us a pass then to not upholding international obligations? No, I don't think so. Um, whilst Scotland is to be commended for, um, in a sense, holding on to its welfareist approach when everyone else has abandoned it um, and some countries are returning to it, I don't think that this means that you are not obliged to take note of and comply with international or regional standards. That, after all, is what standard setting is for. Um, it is to ensure that nobody considers themselves exceptional, so exceptional that they can deviate from the standards. If that were the case, I'm afraid a great many countries would consider themselves too exceptional to conform with standards. And so I would say that, uh, so, uh, that, that Scotland should really, um, um, to complete its well-respected system, ensure that it does conform with international standards. Okay, thank you. And, and the second question I wanted to ask you was about the capacity of a young person to understand the consequences of, of their actions. Um, and I'd be interested in your view on, on, on the benefits of carrying out a psychological assessment to determine whether a young person fully understands the consequences and allow that psychological assessment to build into the approach that we take and whether it's, it, it's taken down a criminal justice route or a welfare route. And it would allow us to um, take a more nuanced approach to, to young people and, and crime. Do you consider that would be a beneficial way to approach this There are many facets to your question. So let me start with um, the, the earlier part, and that is the capacity of a young person to be able to... Um, I think there are two legs of this. One is the child's capacity to be able to um, understand their actions and whether they're lawful or not, and to act in accordance with that knowledge as well at the time and in the circumstances. And the other leg of it is their ability to understand criminal proceedings. And I think that very young children 
um, of the age group that we're talking about, let's take the 12 and 13 year olds, are at a double disadvantage. On the one hand, their frontal cortex is still very undeveloped and we would not expect them to have very good understanding um, of the law or why things are lawful or unlawful. They may have a basic understanding of right and wrong by that age, but um, are unlikely to be able to resist impulses um, at that age. Coming into the mix, then, is in early adolescence, what we are increasingly understanding about adolescent brains through the wealth of developmental psychology and brain science information, uh, which I'm sure has been brought to your attention, um, is that adolescent brains are going through a phase of um, plasticity and um, even instability where impulse control becomes... Uh, at heightened risk, shall we say, so that, young, so that children of this age not only have insufficient knowledge about the world, but they're also moving into adolescence, and so they are struggling with the fact that they are more likely to be influenced by peers, more likely to be triggered by social cues um, than younger children even, um, and, of course, than adults. And so, in a sense, 12- and 13-year-olds might be doubly disadvantaged uh, because of the fact that they are still so young, therefore their frontal cortexes are still at a very early developmental stage, and, in addition to that, they have all of the... Um, the, the, the uh, difficulties that the adolescent brain then introduces as well. Um, the second part of your question, I think, um, moved on to the issues. Uh, sorry, could you please remind me about the second part of your question? The, the, the second part of my question was whether or not a, a psychological assessment should be done um, whenever we are considering whether um, a young person should be taken down a welfare or a criminal justice route, and it would allow us to take a more nuanced approach. And, and I was going to further go on and ask you about adverse childhood experiences, um, be, because there is much more a, an understanding of the impact that adverse childhood experiences have on the way a young person um, acts and behaves. So if, if it, almost extending the knowledge we have about adverse childhood experiences and building in a psychological assessment when we are looking at the approach that, that we take to a young person um, may completely alter the way we deal with someone. Yes, thank you for the reminder. Um, I think age setting is by its very nature quite arbitrary. Um, but it's the kind of thing that lawyers tend to like to do because we, we prefer to have a standard. We prefer to say we want to treat everybody in a similar way and we want to set an age uh, so that we can have certainty in the law and so that officials like police know what they need to do when they confront um, a child who is either below a certain age or, or above a certain age. However... Um, Psychosocial specialists definitely always prefer to look at individuals as individuals and to try to assess. Now, there are, I think, a combination of the two is possibly ideal. We need to set standards be because we need to come in line with standards that are there and we need to have a certain amount of certainty. And to allow an individual assessments, for example, to go you know, you might face a situation where you could say, well, this particular child um, is so advanced uh, in certain ways that even though he's only 11, he could still be held criminally responsible. And you, you will get yourself into uh, unfairness if you rely only on the individual assessment. So I think something like saying, well, below a certain age, we will not prosecute, but within a certain age range, we should do individual assessments. And um, there, there is some very good literature that looks at this kind of thing. Um, uh, I would recommend Enis Delmage, D-E-L-M-A-G-E, -E, who's looked at a medico... She's written a medico-legal perspective on the minimal age of criminal responsibility, and I'd be very happy to provide those references um, to your secretariat after the session so that you can, you can read the articles yourself. But what she essentially um, proposes is a minimum age of 14 and then assessment um, of 14 to 16-year-olds um, in order to determine um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And then even possibly shifting the onus to 
the, to the offender for 16 and 17 year olds, but still allowing assessment and medical, uh, medico, psycho, um, social assessments to be done, um, to, to be brought into the question of mens rea. So I think um, there, there is certainly um, literature that supports the, the approach that you're taking. Um, one thing that the, the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and particularly the, um, the committee has always indicated, is that they, they, pref they, they prefer um, clarity in standard setting rather than allowing different ages to be applied for different off offences, for example. But I know that that's not what you're talking about. You're just talking about uh, an individualised approach using assessment I would say yes, if the country is able to do that and has the resources to do it, yes, but against a backdrop of nevertheless having a clear minimum age below which you will not prosecute. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for that very helpful response, and I would be grateful if you could provide um, the links to the, the documents that you spoke about in your answer. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll hand over to Alec Cole Hamilton now. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Skelton. Thank you very much for making time to see us. My name is Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm a Liberal Democrat MSP. Uh, and for the record, uh, remind members of my register of interest, being former convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Uh, Professor Skelton, the, the UN committee has obviously been on a journey um, on this issue, and that started with General Comment 10, and the revision that we are now considering, I think, is it General Comment 27, or, or whatever it's called, uh, which we'll see it... Sorry. You look like you wanted to come in there. Um, so general comment, the new general comment we're considering will will set that new floor at 14. Do you anticipate that being the last word in this? Or do you think that the UN committee may in the future, when all state parties have the, have achieved that floor of 14, to say, right, come on, guys, let's, let's go further, and, and the new expected limit is 16 or, or something similar? I would say that... Um, from the outset, with general comment number 10, the committee was already asking states to themselves con continually consider increasing the minimum age. Um, and obviously, one understands that, you know, the, the committee is dealing with such a wide range of different countries with very different experiences, with di very different legal systems and so on. And so we have to try to um, ensure that our guidance to states... Um, allows them to progress as fast as they can along their own trajectories. And so, therefore, we would keep encouraging all states individually as they appear before us to say, um, can you not, uh, would you not consider um, raising the age again? Ha are you constantly um, monitoring your system to see what is happening, what are the trends, and so on? Um, but, but not, I don't want to be understood to say that uh, we will simply continue extending and extending um, unreasonably. There is a point, obviously, at which um, states will, will say um, we, we've found what we believe in our country to be the right place. But at this stage, the committee has already said it commends states that set minimum ages of four. Uh, 15 and 16, and are now encouraging states to set their minimum age at, at at least 14. Um, one of the reasons we're undertaking this legislative process is that for many years Scotland has uh, suffered an international rebuke for being so demonstrably below the expected international minimums on this. I, I'm glad that we are making progress. Can I ask, um, are we an outlier or are we in the majority? I mean, do member states usually ignore... Uh, the international minimums, or, or is it is it the few and far between? Um, uh, well, certainly it depends whether you want to view yourself against the world or against Europe. But against Europe, you're a strong outlier um, with an, a minimum age of eight. Um, against the world, it, it often depends on. Um, the history. So in Africa, for example, what we see is that countries that were colonized by the French um, or the Portuguese tend to have higher minimum ages of criminal responsibility, around 13 or 14. And those that were colonized by the British tend to have low minimum ages um, of around seven or eight, often with the Dole in Capax presumption, which most colonies did not jettison at the time when the United Kingdom got rid of them. Um, and so to, to some extent, what we see is a kind of um, 
legacy of colonization. However, I'm glad to tell you that many countries in Africa, all of those that have now recently reviewed their uh, juvenile justice legislation, have increased the minimum age of criminal responsibility, some to 12 and some to 14. That's great to hear. Thank you. Um, in terms of the process that this parliament has been on, I mean, it, it is it's a journey, obviously, but it is the machinery of Parliament doesn't fixate on one issue for very long. It tends to pass legislation and then move on to something. And, and it has been 80 years since we, um, as a country, re uh, last reviewed Age of Criminal Responsibility. My anxiety is it may be some time again. So what we fix it at now is important. We've heard a lot, though, from uh, stakeholders within the Children's Hearing Strata and indeed the Lord Advocate this morning that... Um, additional work will need to be done to our institutions to, to ready that. And that is why I've brought forward a couple of amendments with a, an initial, on a royal assent, uh, uplift to 12, which was the original bill, but with the sunrise clause after a period of 18 months or so uh, to lift to either 14 or 16 respectively. Um, would that satisfy the concerns of the international community if we, if we did it in that staggered process to allow us to do the work? I see the, the concern that you have is that obviously when you're making a decision as big as this, you'll, you'll be wanting to, to, to make sure that you set it at the right stage and that you um, are... Clearly, it's better if you can do it all in one go. It's not unfamiliar to me, this idea of doing it in a staggered phase because um, there are other countries that have chosen to do it in that way. If you... If Scotland decides to do it in that way, I think it's really important that that be included in the legislation itself and not uh, simply as a, well, we'll re reconvene in a few years' time and see, but actually set time frames and have... And if it is because you're trying to collect data already yourself or your institutions, it's important to know what has to be done within those time frames. Okay, thank you. Um, Annie Wells, are you going to come in? Hi there, Professor. Um, I'm Annie Wells, one of the MSPs. Um, we heard this morning from the Lord Advocate about some of the serious harmful behaviour committed by children over the age of 12. Um, cases such as culpable homicide and rape. And what we have to look at with this as well is how do we make sure that we get the balance of rights correct for, for the victims in this as well? And how, how would we take that sort of a journey and bring public opinion along with us, or what impact would it have in public confidence? I understand what you're saying, and I think that this is um, something that, of course, isn't going to change. Even if you delay by 18 months or two years, um, the, the, the reality out there is not going to change. And so at some point, it requires the courage to say, we must do what is right when it is right. <laughs> um, and, and obviously one has to have, uh, one has to bring the public along um, and explain to them as one goes. But I really do think that um, those kinds of issues clearly do come into the mix. It is, it is something I know that all politicians would be worried about because of uh, public concern. But, but the fact of the matter is that wherever you draw the line, there is a possibility that the day after you pass the law, uh, a crime might be committed by the cohort, the age co cohort that then uh, will not be prosecuted. If that was the right thing to do, then it was the right thing to do, even though the next day um, it may be difficult to explain that to the public, but as much preparation of the public beforehand and as much information about the reasons why this is being done um, will help to ameliorate that kind of uh, a, a possible negative response that might occur. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much for that answer. I think the thing that sort of stuck with me today was when the Lord Advocate had spoken about a case of a young person who had been raped by a, an older person at 13, and he says, how do you actually say to that person what happened to you isn't a crime? And what information should we be given to the victims of this serious harmful behaviour? And that really just stuck with me, and I think that would stick with the general public. And a lot of the time as well, people will be OK with saying, yeah, which right, we put the, the child first until it happens to you or a loved one as well and the sort of a public safety round about that. 
Yes, well, I think it is very important for, from a victim's point of view that their experience should be validated. But I'm not sure that that necessarily has to always happen within the discourse of crime. So people who have been victims um, need to have the acknowledgement that what happened to them was wrong um, and um, that they should obviously provide it with all of the support that, that is necessary. Um, but I don't think it necessarily is essential for, for that victim to see this in terms of whether or not this is handled as a crime or not. Um, I, I, I think um, we need to find more restorative justice mechanisms to help uh, victims um, recover from the impacts of crimes rather than necessarily saying that we have to stick with the discourse of crime in order to redress harm. Thank you. Yours. Good afternoon, um, Professor. Thank you for joining us. My name is Gail Ross. Um, right at the start, we touched on the um, Scottish hearing system. I just wondered, do you have any examples from any other countries that operate a <coughs> similar system and how that relates to their minimum age of criminal responsibility? Um, I... I think perhaps to some extent the New Zealand system might be comparable um, in the sense that it uh, also um, has a system whereby taking children through the criminal justice system is a last resort and uh, a whole series of interventions, restorative justice interventions, are usually used uh, rather than doing that. Um, although their welfare system and their and their criminal justice system are not one and the same, although dealt with in the same act. Uh, their minimum age of criminal responsibility is 14. Okay, thank you. And just to go back to um, other comparisons, when we were talking about going to 12 now in order for us to get things ready to move to 14 at a specified date, and you said that other countries had done that in a staggered way as well. Can you give us some examples of those? Yes, I can uh, give you an example of my own country, which is South Africa. South African Parliament has recently passed a law uh, increasing the minimum age of criminal responsibility from 10 to 12, with a clause uh, to reconsider with the view to increasing the age to, they don't say to what, uh, but increasing the age, they say, uh, within five years of the Act coming into operation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Skilton. Um, Ruth McGuire, I'm the convener of the committee. Um, Sorry, no, no. Point Sorry, no. <laughs> Can I ask yeah, you please. to um, expand on the concerns that, that you shared in relation to um, police involvement with, with children that are, are currently over the, the age? What are the, the specific practices that you feel need to be addressed? Um, I think the, I mentioned policing in the sense that um, because they are the point of first contact in any system, um, it's very important for police to, to know and understand um, what the rules are relating to children who are above or below the minimum age of criminal responsibility because their first-line response uh, must be guided by what the rules are relating to children of that age. Um, and so I think... Um, any, uh, any changes to the law have to go hand in hand with a very good training um, of police and any other frontline officials that are going to come into contact with children um, as, they, as they come into contact with the system. You would agree that the, um, there should be a duty on the police to um, safeguard and promote well-being of children, first and foremost? Um, yes, I would say so. I think that this is um, very often the, well, it is the first contact that the child will have with the system in most instances. And so um, the, the child's experience will be clearly um, affected by the, the way in which the, they're dealt with by the police. Thank you. I have a supplementary question. 
Thank, thank you, convener. Um, Professor Skelton, in your uh, answer to Gail Ross about international examples of a staggered approach where countries have sought to meet the international minimum standards in a phased way, you referenced South Africa and that it had passed legislation to lift to 12 with a view to, mm -hmm. to lifting still further in five years, mandatory consideration. Um, is that an acceptable place for a member state to land? Um, I would say um, I myself am rather disappointed with the outcome of the of the hearings. Um, uh, I was among the group of uh, people pushing for the age of criminal responsibility to be set at 14 in South Africa. However, I think South Africa does have a few more complex issues to deal with in terms of provisioning for children below the age of 14, because South Africa does not have something akin to the hearing system. Therefore, there would need to be the development of probation services and alternative services for children below the minimum age. Um, and therefore, perhaps there might be more reason for, for taking time, but I would still say that five years was uh, too long. Uh, I also think um, I should mention that in South Africa, the, although the minimum age is 10, it goes together with the Doli in Capex presumption, which means that all children below 14 are presumed to lack criminal capacity. So South Africa retained the 14 uh, upper limit of criminal capacity. So those children still have protection under the, the, the law, um, and that protection has not been done away with. So uh, the South African Parliament uh, re resisted um, moves to actually sort of lower the age to 12 from the Doli in Capex presumption. Some were pushing for that. They decided not to do so. They retained the Doli in Capex presumption, which remains in place for 12 and 13 year olds. So um, in a sense, Scotland doesn't have that advantage. You're, you're, there's no protection in the meanwhile for your 12 and 13 year olds. In the South African bill, um, there is currently protection for 12 and 13 year olds where a presumption operates in their favor and the state would have to prove criminal capacity. And, um, and so that obviously uh, does at least provide some kind of mantle of protection for them. So that the, there are always these important nuances to keep in mind when comparing across different jurisdictions. So, so by extension, it would not be acceptable to the UN Committee for Scotland in this legislation to mirror exactly what South Africa has done by getting to 12 now with an obligation on a future parliament to consider going further um, because, because of all the reasons you've outlined and actually um, 14 is, is the floor that the UN has established. Exactly. Um, the, the Committee on the Rights of the Child would certainly, I think, not approve of South Africa's um, manner of dealing with it, um, even though South Africa would, would probably try to explain it on the basis of the Dole in Capax presumption. Uh, the Committee prefers a one age rather than two uh, ages with the possibility of prosecution for certain children in between. Um, and so I think you, you're quite right. The, the position of the Committee would be um, that... Scotland should rather move to 14 immediately, particularly as there's no provision for protection of children between now and the future date at which you, if you decide to go that route, would be protecting those children's rights. Thank you. Okay. Um, Professor Skelton, thank you very much for your, your evidence to committee this afternoon. It's been um, very helpful. The next meeting of our committee will be on Thursday, the 31st of January, when committee intends to begin consideration of amendments to sta at stage two of Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. And I close the meeting. <laughs>